Hi there and welcome to your third lecture for uh, week four of contemporary art and this is just a little probably short lecture on a couple of other important American pop artists who emerged in the early 60s and I just want to look at a few of their representative works and talk a little bit about the, the two of them. So we'll be looking at Roy Lichtenstein and uh, Klaus Oldenburg, a painter and a sculptor basically respectively. And uh, these guys, <clears throat> Lichtenstein died in 1997. Um, actually, Klaus Oldenburg is still alive and kicking and still doing projects. But they both work in this kind of pop art sensibility where they take their inspiration from everyday life and they have a much more playful attitude towards the work that they do than the earlier generation that we looked at, the, the guys in the 40s and the early 50s. Um, it, so, just a couple more of these interesting artists to look at. The first of them is Roy Lichtenstein. This is his Hopeless from 1963. It is an oil painting on canvas. You can't see it too well in this image, unfortunately, but in this image, which is a large-scale oil painting on canvas, so it's a fine art medium, uh, what he's done is he's taken a close-up from a Sunday comic, you know, a Sunday uh, or a, co a comic book, and he's blown up that one frame and made it into the subject of this whole painting. He's also replicated the technique that was used in printing these kind of cheap, you know, mass market comic books that are printed on newsprint um, and True Confessions magazines and stuff like that that are printed on newsprint, where the colors are printed onto the paper using a series of teeny tiny regular little dots. They're called Ben Day dots because the person that invented this printing technique for newsprint making color um, color comics in the newspaper <clears throat> is, uh, his name was Benjamin Day. So the Ben Day dot is actually replicated here in this oil canvas, or this oil painting on canvas. Uh, Lichtenstein even used a stencil to make sure that his painted dots would be uniform in size. So here the subject matter, the style, the imagery is all coming from a comic book medium and then being put into a large or lowbrow medium and being put into a large scale high art format. There are a lot of things going on here obviously. He's playing with the boundary between what's considered high art and what's considered low art. He's also playing with the idea of originality, and this is something that really becomes a major theme in the contemporary period, or has been and continues to be a major theme in the contemporary period, this question of, of uniqueness and individuality and, uh, and creativity, right? Because this is not an original image created only by Roy Lichtenstein. He took this out of some comic book. <clears throat> some, obviously, other artists had to design the comic book, but is not given credit for making this giant painting that is signed Roy Lichtenstein. And in fact, truth to be told, Roy Lichtenstein, just like Andy Warhol and many other artists, including lots of the artists who are big names today, had a studio full of assistants who did a lot of the painting for him. <clears throat> By the end of Lichtenstein's life, in fact, he wasn't actually executing paintings because he was getting older, uh, but his assistants were doing so. And, but of course, then they get signed and sold as Lichtenstein paintings. Uh, so this, is, and this will be an ongoing issue, the whole question of where does creativity lie? Where is the identity of the artist? What place does, um, does um, uh, appropriation have in the realm of fine arts? Here's another example of a Lichtenstein painting from the early 60s. I think Drowning Girl is from maybe 63 or 64. And here again, same things that I was just saying about applied. This is a high art medium, the oil painting on canvas, and it's a low art source, the comics. The, um, uh, or in this case, actually I have the original source that he's blending together here. So he's chosen a part of a larger image that he has incorporated into this oil painting. And let me show you the original image. So there you can see where he's p chosen this part of the cover of this kind of trashy um, romance and put it into this, this oil painting format. He's also obviously working with the kind of flatness and abstraction that you might expect to see 
in um, a, a, an abstract expressionist type of painter, but obviously it's not executed in that way. And he's using those bende dots to create the areas of uh, shaded color in his oil painting as well as the original source material. Here's another example of Lichtenstein's working method in the 1960s. Here he's just taken a a nice design ad out of the Sunday paper and he's focused in and, and um, made a composition out of it and then added color to it. So he continued to work in this kind of vein and then with the idea of doing repetitive images and appropriating the imagery of other artists and really kind of blending or mixing up the whole idea of fine and, and commercial and high and low art. So later on he does this series called the Rouen Cathedral series, R-O-U-E-N, Rouen Cathedral, R-O-U-E-N. Rouen Cathedral was a subject that had been painted in the 1890s by Claude Monet, very prominent painter, impressionist painter. Monet, who you may be familiar with, um, was a guy who believed in the primacy of light and color in painting. And one of the things he did, along with the other impressionists, was he would choose one object or one view or one site, and he would paint it over and over and over at different times of day, different weather conditions, different seasons of the year, with the idea being that the image that he's looking at, or the cathedral in this case that he was looking at, really just became a vehicle for him to explore atmosphere and light. So it's the same image but painted over and over and over again under different conditions so that you have different color combinations. Well here, Lichtenstein has taken Monet's Run Cathedral series and redone it in a series of, I believe these are screen prints. And as you can see here, those bende dots are in evidence. And you can see he's done these two or sometimes three color, uh, very much replicating the printing process of um, trashing newspapers. And then really, this these images, if you, I mean, I think you can see from the two here, they really dissolve into a kind of optical illusion. So they really become these almost, you know, just interesting abstractions in themselves. In the, especially in the one on the right, it's very hard to pick out the actual shape of Rouen Cathedral. It's there, but it's pretty hard to see just because of the way these colors are interacting with one another. So you can see where even though, I mean, we still classify Lichtenstein as a pop artist, he's also doing these kinds of experimental approaches to um, his work that turn it from simple, you know, jokey pop art into this kind of interesting um, um, formal experimentation with color interactions, which would put him, you know, closer to the minimalists in some way. Here's another one from the Lorraine Cathedral series on the left of Lichtenstein. So you can see how it's the same image and then just depending on what color combinations, two or three colors that are being used, you get very different effects. And then there's just one of Monet's paintings on the right from the 1890s. So the Rouen Cathedral series, again, R-O-U-E-N, Rouen Cathedral. Um, this is a Lichtenstein's further developing of this theme of, you know, reappropriating imagery, of blending high and low culture, and of, in this case, really kind of riffing on art history. Um, so putting him really firmly in the tradition of pop art and in mid-century kind of modern art. The other guy that I want to look at today briefly is Klaus Oldenburg, who is, <clears throat> I believe he's Swiss by birth, but he moves to the States when he's pretty young, and so he starts working as an artist in the States when he's in the, um, what, late 1950s. So he opened a store, or a gallery, a shop actually, called The Store in 1961. Um, and this was a store that was filled with Oldenburg's replications of um, everyday consumer goods, food, clothing, other everyday commodities. And in the um, store, he offered up these sort of like 
just mini sculptures of stuff that he had created. So here, let me show you for example. 7-Up. This is one of the objects that was available in the store. It is a sculpture. It's made out of basically um, almost, well, it's, you know, a plaster on chicken wire, basically, sculpture that's been painted. It is not an actual can of 7-Up. It's a replication. It's a play on that. So here again, just like with Liechtenstein and other pop artists, you've got this blending or blurring of imagery that is high and low or media that are high and low, um, the appropriation of commercial images, uh, a kind of playful messing around with the whole idea of consumption and commodities and consumer culture. Consumer culture is just a kind of broad term to describe what's happening and still happens now, but I mean what's really emerging in the 1960s is the America has become very prosperous and mass media and mass production have gotten to such a level that you've really got, um, as Andy Warhol was saying, you know, everybody from Liz Taylor and the president to the bum on the street can buy the same consumer goods and have a sort of, you know, quasi equality thanks to consumer goods. So there's an emphasis placed on the idea of consumption and how important it is. And I mean, this is something advertisers still play on, that the stuff you buy says something about you as a person, right? I can think of those recent commercials for the Hummer that was all about, you know, how uh, if you buy a Hummer, it makes you more powerful or whatever. Um, yeah, I'm sure you guys probably remember the, the ads I'm talking about, but this is a kind of common theme in consumer culture and in advertising, this idea that the stuff you buy says something about you, you know? it's why people buy name brand um, clothing instead of store brand clothing, or why it's so important for some people to have Louis Vuitton luggage or something like that. Anyway, so this is <clears throat> on the lower end of the scale, kind of the stuff that um, Lichtenstein, or excuse me, Klaus Oldenburg is playing with early on in the store. And of course, taking just mundane, everyday objects and making them into uh, works of art. Here's another example from the store. This is a glass case with pies, or assorted pies in a case. The case itself was not fabricated by Oldenburg. That's a commercially available from restaurant supply houses pie rack that you would have, you know, on display if you go to, I don't know, Big Boy or whatever. You'd see pies on display and something like that. And then he's got individual pies. They're actually little plaster sculptures. And you could go in and buy these pies. And here's another, again, restaurant supply case that is filled with desserts and meat. Uh, that's a, a brisket there on the bottom. Uh, things that you could buy essentially at the store. So this is um, called Pastry Case. Oldenburg was also uh, very um, integral in the early development of a different kind of art that we're going to be talking about in the next couple weeks, and that is performance art. So, and really you can imagine how something like this would almost blend into performance art, where you have a gallery set up to look like a store, and then you have people coming in to purchase the objects in the so-called store, which are also really sculptures and art objects. So you have a kind of interesting, um, a kind of interesting performance aspect where the viewer or the consumer, the gallery goer, is part of making this into a um, commentary on commodity fetish and shopping and things like that. Here again from, this is a little bit, I think this is also 61, two cheeseburgers with everything. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, plaster sculptures meant to look like the real thing. Uh, a little bit. And then also, of course, what could be more American and more consumer friendly than the two cheeseburgers with everything. And just like his compatriots in the pop art movement, you know, he's taking his subject matter from the everyday world and from commercial culture, not from something spiritual or grand or tragic or meaningful in the way that, you know, I think, geez, compare this with Jean Paul Fautrier's head of a hostage, and you couldn't get really much more different approaches to the idea of what art is supposed to be than, uh, than those two polar extremes in sculpture. 
<clears throat> Oldenburg also started experimenting with different media for making sculpture, and he's a real pioneer in the field of soft sculpture, which is essentially three-dimensional objects that are made out of fabric and stuffed. And so here, floor cake on the left and floor cone on the right, that's an ice cream cone. It looks, in this, on my screen, it looks a little bit like a carrot because of the orange and green, but it's actually meant to be an ice cream cone. These were soft sculptures, that is, sewn out of fabric, um, three-dimensional objects, and really large. I mean, this, the floor cake is one that you could actually sit on like a sofa. Um, you're not meant to, but I mean, it's big enough for that. And here again, not only are we playing with media or playing with boundaries and high and low and, you know, what's appropriate subject for sculpture, but even the whole idea of a sculpture that, you know, traditionally sculptures are supposed to be rigid. They're supposed to be metal or wood. They're supposed to be um, um, hard, right? So having these malleable, soft, punchable, foldable, readjustable sculptures is also kind of poking at the whole idea of what is sculpture, what is it supposed to be, what's the whole tradition of sculpture. And there again, uh, another old, early Oldenburg ice cream being tasted from 1964. So just, you know, kind of jokey um, and uh, sort of inviting you to tr pr pretend like you're pr tasting the ice cream and then yet not being possible, right, to actually taste the ice cream. Okay, so I think this probably gets you some idea of, oh, yeah, Oldenburg said he wanted to create an art that is a frustration of expectations. That's his quote. The spoon is a, a real metal spoon, The I mean, store-bought spoon. So, you know, if, at first glance, you might expect this to be melting soft texture, and then when you actually touch it, you'd see that it's rigidly stuck into this plaster and porcelain um, goop right, that doesn't move, that doesn't, uh, that resists your attempt to scoop it out. So a sensory kind of cognitive dissonance, which is also something he does with those floor sculptures, those soft sculptures. Uh, Oldenburg continues to work in the, um, in large scale as well as soft or small scale sculpture. And in fact, he becomes by the, in the late 60s, the 70s, into the 80s and 90s, and still today, a popular sculptor to create large-scale public works of art. And he does these by, uh, his approach is usually to take some sort of everyday object and then make a sculptural version that is blown up, uh, you know, many, many, many times out of scale. So here again, it's a kind of frustration of expectations or cognitive dissonance that you see that is being generated by these kind of jokey sculptures. Here, for example, is his giant three-way plug. You would recognize this as the kind of thing you stick into an outlet to make uh, a single outlet hold three different plugs, right? So this is actually a giant version of a three-way plug that is a sculpture in Oberlin, Ohio. And here's a 1976 clothespin in Philadelphia. 1976 clothespin in Philadelphia. I believe this is about 60 feet tall, if I'm remembering correctly. And, you know, it's a Corten steel and a stainless steel base. As you can see, uh, uh, just an everyday object taken completely out of scale and then um, put into this public sculpture area. So again, you know, frustrating expectations, blending high and low, taking uh, cues from everyday life. And then one more Oldenburg sculpture, and then we'll be done for today. This is his Spoon Bridge from 1988. This is a, um outdoor sculpture that's at the Walker Arts Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's become a kind of mascot for the city, actually. You kind of, you, know, you can see it on a lot of... Um, tourist tchotchkes that you can buy in Minneapolis. So here it is a giant spoon with a cherry on one end. Uh, it says spoon bridge, but you can't really walk over it and it's really not over water or anything like that. So, but it's a giant version of an everyday object, very playful um, and very joking. And this is a medium that Oldenburg continues to work in or an idiom that he continues to work in as a, as a, as a, um, 
as an artist. So that's my quick tour through a couple of the other major players in the realm of pop art from the 1960s. And when we start talking next week, I believe we start talking about um, performance art, another important development of the 1960s. And I'll see you then.